This is the Divorce Education Series presented by Findling Law. And in this topic, we're going to discuss the process of discovery. So what is discovery? A great way to think about discovery is to take away the letter Y. Why do we conduct discovery? Well, what's left if you take away the letter Y? To discover. To discover what? To discover evidence. But not just any evidence. It has to be relevant evidence. We ask questions during the discovery process. And we have to ask questions that are somehow reasonably calculated to lead to admissible evidence. Now in Michigan, they give us broad leeway. We can ask lots of questions. Probably if we ask, why is the sky blue? That would be irrelevant. But we can certainly ask speculative questions as it relates to your situation to help you prepare for your case. So why do we conduct discovery? Well, we have to understand what is the nature and the extent of the marital estate. What is there to divide? When a client comes into my office and says, what is this divorce going to look like at the end of the day? Well, the first thing that we have to understand is what is the nature and the extent of the estate? What is there to divide? What are the assets? What are the liabilities? And sometimes you may not know all of them. So we have to ask. And we ask in the process called discovery. Now we also may want to find out an individual's position on an issue, maybe regarding custody or parenting time. Do you think it's in the best interest of the minor children that dad or mom spend equal parenting time with the children? If not, why? We may also want to discover business valuations, right? Is there a mechanism by which we can value that business? Or when was that property purchased? We conduct discovery to understand what we need to talk about as it relates to property and debt, children, alimony, all of the aspects in your divorce. So how do we conduct discovery? Well, there are really five mechanisms. Interrogatories, request to production of documents, which are typically part of interrogatories as well. Request for admissions, subpoena, and deposition. Well, let's talk about these. Interrogatories come from the root to interrogate. These are written questions under oath, subject to the penalties of perjury, and most of the time lawyers have pre-written questions. For instance, describe your employer for the past three years. List your retirement accounts. How much do you have in your savings? Have you had extramarital sexual contacts or an affair? But then, during their interview with your lawyer, we ask specific questions as it relates to your case and your situation, whatever that may be. The up north property. How much money did your brother give for a down payment? Do you have a promissory note? Whatever may be particular to your case, your lawyer is going to tailor these interrogatories. And we're also going to request production of documents. Those are usually included. They don't have to be, but they're usually included in interrogatories. Please provide the mortgage. Please provide the bank statements. Attach them to your interrogatories. Requests for admissions are a really powerful tool. We ask questions and we say, admit this is true. And if you fail to answer them, or you admit them, then they're considered admitted at trial. So failing to answer discovery requests, especially a request for admission, can have very severe consequences. What is a subpoena? It's a court order. Why do we use them? Well, we use them primarily to get documents from an independent source. We may have asked for a request for a production of documents that say um, credit card statements, and the individual only gave us partial credit card statements. So why not ask the credit card company directly? Now, a lawyer can sign a subpoena as a court order and say, Dear credit card company, provide the statement for the past three years. Or, Dear employer, please provide the gross compensation package for this employee for the past three years. And we get the answer independently from an independent source, not the individual answering the interrogatories, the party to the action, but a company. All right. When do we use depositions? I like to use depositions as a follow-up mechanism. 
Firstly, because they can be expensive. You have a court reporter, you have lawyers, you're sitting in a room and you're asking questions. Lots of people, lots of time, lots of energy. But oftentimes we're uncomfortable with answers to interrogatories or requests to admit or subpoenas. And we want to ask face to face the individual about this matter or that matter. A deposition is the perfect way to accomplish that task. It's hard to lie to somebody when you're looking them in the eye. Now remember, all of these discovery techniques are under oath and subject to the penalties of perjury. That's a severe consequence. Let's talk about that. So when we talk about the penalties of perjury, this last line right here is really what I want you to focus on. Lying under oath is a felony, and it's punishable by imprisonment not more than 15 years. Nothing wakes up a person more. Nothing is bigger incentive than recognizing that if they lie, they're going to jail. And in Michigan courts, if you're caught lying, there is always, in virtually every case, a severe consequence for doing so. So let's talk about some guidelines. I like to tell clients, only answer what is asked. Listen carefully, read carefully. Don't give more information. Don't volunteer information unless you have to, unless it's specifically asked. Oftentimes, you go well beyond what's been asked and it causes problems. Now, in simple cases, we may waive discovery altogether and merely just do affidavits of assets and liabilities. But if there's a dispute regarding anything, it's very important to only answer what is asked and always review your answers with the lawyer. Now, in a deposition, you don't necessarily have that opportunity because the lawyer may be sitting there and can pose an objection, but certainly cannot tell you how to answer the question. But with regard to these other discovery techniques, especially interrogatories, requests to produce documents, and uh, requests to admit, you should be going over these answers with your lawyer. Your lawyer is not going to change your answer. Your lawyer is not going to tell you to lie. But your lawyer may structure the answer in a, in a manner that's most appropriate for your case. And like anything in life, preparation is always key. Understanding if your deposition is going to be taken, that you should have sat down with your lawyer and talked about the questions and reviewed and, and practiced answers beforehand. So, a general disclaimer here. I'm giving you guidelines, okay? Now, they may not apply in every case. For instance, sometimes I tell my clients, well, the lawyer's just not getting it. Even though they didn't ask the question, let's provide them a broader answer. Hopefully it'll make it less expensive, make the case easier to settle. So these are guidelines. You should always discuss with your lawyer how you should answer your discovery request and what strategies you should take. And of course, it's inevitable that you have questions and we want to be here for you. We've made it easy for you to contact us. You can call us toll free at 877 your firm, that's 968-7347. I provided you with my email address. Feel free to email me, daniel at findlinglaw.com. Of course, you can also visit us at thedivorceguy.com. Thank you for listening to this Michigan Divorce Education Series. We have a number of topics discussed in this series. We welcome you and invite you to visit them all. Thank you for your time. Hopefully, this has been meaningful for you.